1971, a permanent World's Fair looking towards the future opened. Over its lifetime, it will transition to become a mix of amusement rides, exhibits, and attractions. For many years, it provided an exciting, future-looking place for those visiting, before the majority of its attractions were abandoned. I wake up with a smile on my face, cause I'm gonna take the kids to Ontario Place. We're gonna hit some rides and play in the sun, cause kids, they wanna have fun. They just wanna, they just wanna. <laughs> In 1967, Montreal would be home to the International and Universal Exposition, or Expo 67. Built on a man-made island, the World's Fair would be home to six themed pavilions with 62 participating nations, and would later be considered one of the most successful World's Fairs of the 20th century, the highlight of Canada's centennial year. With over 90 pavilions representing man and his world, each would bring their own distinct style. While perhaps the most well-known World's Fair, the 1964-65 New York's World Fair had a huge Walt Disney influence, Walt had passed away five months before the opening of the 67 Fair, and after just a few meetings during the planning stage for this new exposition. The Disney company, however, would have a presence at the 67 Fair after his death, with a 22-minute production called Canada 67, presented in Circle Vision 360. This attraction would be a precursor for what would later come to the Canadian Pavilion at Epcot in the 80s. Something else at the Expo would also offer remnants that would be seen in the future Epcot Park, the United States Pavilion, which would have a monorail, or mini-rail, passing through its centerpiece, a giant geodesic dome. The nearly 250-foot tall structure housed multiple space-age displays of the USA, Designed by Buckminster Fuller, the same person that would popularize the term Spaceship Earth and become a large influence on the iconic attraction at Epcot. Expo 67, the international twin island wonderland is ready for its gala opening ceremonies. Host Canada is among 62 nations who have built 100 pavilions on the 1,000 acre site of entertainment and education. Expo 67 would also be home to a large 130 acre attractions park complete with a log flume style shoot the shoots type of ride that was becoming increasingly popular at the time. Expo 67's amusement park would later be known as La Ronde. It is still in operation today and owned by Six Flags. Expo 67 would be iconic, a celebration of not just the country, but the whole world, leaving a huge mark on Canada. In the next province over, in Ontario, they had held a fair in some form since 1846, which took place in Toronto, minus a couple of missed years. In 1912, the TIE would change its name to the Canadian National Exhibition, the CNE. It would be a place that would showcase the latest technological advances around the world. A building known as the Ontario Government Building was constructed on the site in 1926 to become a space for the Government of Ontario to house exhibits during the CNE. Let's go to the X. Let's go to the X. So much at the X. Let's go to the X. After the huge success of Expo 67 in Montreal, the government of Ontario decided to replace the CNE building with a new state-of-the-art showcase, originally planned to be located on the nearby Toronto Islands. Instead, just like Expo 67, they would build a man-made island. Heavily inspired by the Expo, Ontario Place would be announced at the opening of the CNE in August 1968 as a major new recreational complex for the use of the people of Ontario. It was built on the waterfront, and would be full of modern design and try and create the same mood that made the Ontario Pavilion at Expo 67 so popular. 
while the inspiration would be a pavilion full of pyramid shapes floating over an exhibit platform in the water, the new Ontario exhibit would feature floating pods. Architect Ebenhard Zeidler would say that the new project would be a showplace for the whole of Ontario, and what better place to create it than on Lake Ontario itself. Construction began in March 1969. Built by the Ontario Department of Trade and Development, City Landfill was used to create a makeshift barrier island for the project to protect it from the sometimes harsh waves and winds of the lake, while also saving millions of dollars on foundation construction. These man-made islands would become home to performances, restaurants, shops, and play areas, making it much more than just an exhibition space. The heart of the original project would be the unique three-story boxes, or pods, suspended over the lake, constructed of steel and aluminium. Seidler said that the structures were designed to give it an illusion of dimensionless space, exploring technology to shape the society of tomorrow. Ontario Place. We sincerely hope you'll enjoy your visit with us today. This is the place to start. This is the place to grow. Come on and be a part of Ontario. This is where we began. Here where the free winds blow. So many dreams to win in Ontario. And this is our place. Ontario The first phase of Ontario Place opened on May 22, 1971, costing 29 million Canadian dollars, more than what was expected. It would cover 96 acres, 51 of which were created from landfill. During the planning phase, more and more have been added to the offerings. A large 2,500 seat outdoor concert venue called the Forum would be located on the Central Hub Island. This unique and later rotating stage could accommodate up to 8,000 more visitors on the hill sat on the grass surrounding it. There was a marina, and just like the 67 Expo, Ontario Place would also feature a dome. This time, a triodetic spear dome that would be home to the first permanent IMAX installation in the world, a technology that had debuted at Expo 70 in Japan, and that very first projector would be housed at Ontario Place. This IMAX theatre inside the dome would be home to 800 seats in the 61 foot by 56 foot steel aluminium alloy tube building, adding another iconic building to the area's offerings. Many would come to just call this the Big Golf Ball, long before the Epcot icon would get that same nickname. It's just huge inside. Immense. Oh yeah, don't, don't forget to bring your family. The first year's visitors were warned that Ontario Place was a work in progress that would be ever-changing. While not ready in time for opening, the Eastern Island's two-acre children's village would be complete a year later, in 1972. It was a really incredible mix of playgrounds and climbing equipment that was a dream for children visiting. Attendance-wise, opening year was a huge success, with 2.5 million people visiting the new Ontario Place. The vision and scope of Ontario Place gave promise to the vast potential of Ontario. The then Premier, Bill Davis, said the year it opened that it was a place that always would have one eye on the future, firmly placed in Toronto as a city of the future. This, however, would be a place that would change drastically over its lifetime. Further additions during the opening decade were a water play area in 1973, and what was billed as Canada's first water slide that opened in August 1978. In 1980, seven concrete connected silo-like buildings topped with domes would become home to the Ontario North Now exhibit. They were built on the West Island to showcase Northern Ontario with an emphasis on the wildlife of the area. By the early 80s, Ontario Place was questioned as a government-run project going bad. 
The once highly touted showcase for Ontario's talents and products had lost its direction and was a drain on taxpayers. Ontario Place's attendance had been steadily declining after that opening year high, and they had never made a cent in its 13 years of operation, now losing $1.8 million a year. To fix this, they would try and spend an extra $10 million on a massive overhaul that would hopefully bring in some money. We're at Ontario Place and this is Adventure Island. GoZone is here. GoZone has rides for kids of all ages like Adam Blaster and Stadler Micro Kids. But my favorite ride on Adventure Island is the Wilderness Adventure Ride. It's a plume ride. <laughs> The islands would have a new direction. They would try and compete directly with Canada's Wonderland, the hugely popular theme park north of Toronto. The around 100 acre, three artificial islands and five still pavilions would get a facelift. This new outlook would provide a new theme park-like offering, the biggest expenditure of which would be the 7 million Canadian dollar water flume ride that hoped to bring an extra 200,000 people to visit in the summer. Why would they build a water flume here? The answer was simple. A similar attraction at Canada's Wonderland had increased attendance there by around 15%. The Wilderness Adventure Ride opened in 1984, a 26 six-person boat ride that would traverse a simulated northern wilderness of rapids, canyons, waterfalls, and tunnels. At 2,200 feet long, it would be one of the largest flume rides ever created, taking riders on a four-minute journey over Wilderness Lake, past animated scenes, through a 12-foot-high canyon and into a mine tunnel, ending with an explosion as you splash down the 43-foot drop at the end of the ride. The children's village would also be expanded, with more colour, new playships, and more water fun. For some, this new change of direction for the exhibit was seen as a huge divergence from the original Ontario concept for Ontario Place. Rather than forging its own identity, the provincial government was seen to be on a course to run a copycat theme park. One that was questioned to how it can add to Ontario's legacy. The millions of dollars spent did not increase attendance to the islands. However, they would continue still to add more and more over the years. Ontario Place added two new attractions in 1993, forming the beginning of a water park development that would later be known as Soap City. The first two attractions were Hydrofuge, or tubular water slide that could reach speeds of 50 kilometers per hour. The silos that had been created to showcase Northern Ontario were also converted into a mega maze. Attention, Ocean Rangers Base 7. This is a special tactical bulletin from Command Central. The following year, the largest of the silos was converted into Sea Track, a deep sea submarine simulator attraction built by Simex of Toronto. 95 saw the 873 foot long Rush River Raft Ride replace the original concrete slide that had been located at the attraction since the 70s. Another huge change would be the removal of the Forum, replaced with the Molson Amphitheatre, a new 16,000 capacity outdoor live music venue. The decision to replace the old iconic venue was hugely controversial, and many visitors and fans of the venue were disappointed, most of which still miss the Forum today and attribute it to the start of the downfall for Ontario Place. The former pod exhibit space would also get a new purpose with the Atlantis Complex, a 32,000 square foot entertainment and dining facility. Further slides were also added with the pink twister and purple pipeline in 1997. The changes didn't stop here. They would continue with a new movie for the simulator ride called Mars, new restaurants and food options, and further expansions to the water park. By the park's 30th anniversary season in 2001, Ontario Place had completely changed from its original vision of promoting the best of the province. What didn't change during the island's transition was attendance, and with that, its profit. By 2004, visitors were down by two thirds of the opening crowds, with just one million guests annually, half of which only went to watch concerts. 
While fading, the government asked for requests for ideas to redevelop the site in 2010. 2011 would be the park's 40th anniversary, and it desperately needed a refresh. The winning plan was hoped to be chosen in the summer of 2011, to make it once again a place you wanted to visit. They hoped to bring back the jewel along the waterfront. Of course, in classic Toronto fashion, many of those submissions wanted condos. It was prime real estate downtown and could make people a ton of money. Another prominent idea was for a casino on the land. Many of these created a huge backlash from the community. Officially, in February 2012, the government announced that Ontario Place would be closed and redeveloped with an expected reopening of 2017. Other than the marina, concert venue, and a few select offerings, the park closed in late 2012. Even from its creation, the government-ran site was caught up in multiple political battles, and that would continue. Ontario Place was not on the ropes as much as the government had made out when suddenly closed. They had cited outdated stats in its decision to shut the park. A new water slide had even just been built, one that would never open at Ontario Place. Later, it would find a new home at Canada's Wonderland. Why was the park really closed was questioned. It was projected that at the current rate, Ontario Place would finally reach a break-even point in 2015. And with the $5 million recently spent on improvements along with a new slide, something had to have been offered to cause this sudden closure. Some kind of incentive. Likely, a money-making opportunity was the real reason. While the site was used for select offerings over the following years, much of it remained closed to the public. It will remain this way, and the redevelopment would be nearly as troubled as the park's existence. In 2017, the iconic Sinisphere reopened, and portions of the East Island's parking lot was turned into Trillium Park, a beautiful offering with fire pits, incredible views, and a reason to once again visit the island other than concerts. The remainder of the attractions would sit abandoned, with the slides and sections of the log ride removed after multiple years of neglect and vandalism. The animatronic animals of the flume had been used as part of an art exhibit. Today, a question continues to remain that people have been asking since it opened. What is Ontario Place? There is definitely something special about walking around the islands. From seeing the incredibly futuristic looking buildings looming over the water, to sitting on its shores watching the planes from the air show fly overhead and just looking out over the city. In its current state, however, you can't help but feel sadness for what once was and could have been. 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of a place that began to highlight the future, a permanent world fair showcasing the best of Ontario, built on a lake that is ingrained into the culture of those who live close by. A place that morphed into a mix of water park and theme park, with fun for the whole family. One that children of Toronto brought up during its existence still miss and have incredible memories of. A place that would later become just another abandoned failing offering that today sits full of remnants of the past locked in a battle of development proposals. Its story is somewhat reminiscent of the journey of another permanent World's Fair inspired attraction. One that wasn't run by the government, that would luckily have a different fate. While you can walk freely around the islands today, the future remains uncertain for the once iconic place. There are still many fighting to save it from just becoming another place in Toronto filled with condos. This year, it is expected that the government's redevelopment plans may finally be announced. All they have said so far is that the historic elements would be protected. I guess you could say we're coming into the home stretch. The opening day isn't very far away, May 22nd to be exact. We'll be open from May 22nd right through to Thanksgiving weekend, and we expect something over two million people down during the first season. The pressure is really on now to meet that opening deadline. That's why I like to get down here, check things over, and try to imagine what it's all going to be like. In 2020, Ontario Place was added to the world's Monuments Watch, 
one of 24 heritage sites around the globe in need of a timely or urgent action. The Future of Ontario Place Project and Ontario Place for All, among others, work to build public knowledge of the heritage value of the site and to imagine the future of Ontario Place as a public cultural asset for all Ontarians. An idea that it was always hoped to be. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Extinct. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates and a sneak peek of the next expedition. A special thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel and we will see you next time.